Welcome to session three of the 2020 Autism Hope Summit. This hour's presentation is titled Virginia DARS Services and Special Programs to Support Career Pathway Achievement and is presented by three members of the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services and Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center in Virginia. I'm going to introduce each presenter and then turn it over to them for the presentation. Richard Kreiner earned his master's degree in rehabilitation counseling at Virginia Commonwealth University. He began working for the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services in 2002 and is currently the DARS Autism Project Coordinator. Susie Klein earned her master's degree in vocational rehabilitation counseling and is now a counselor and regional autism subject matter expert with DARS. Susie is certified for customized employment and is currently a positive behavior supports facilitator in training. She also has a wonderful son with autism who is now 31 years old and lives in Alaska with his two children. Susie has spent many years working with people with autism and their families, including working with developmental assessment teams from hospitals and clinics from Alaska and Washington. Ginger Shiflett is the Director of Communication Services at Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center in Fishersville, where she has worked as a speech language pathologist for 22 years. She has served individuals with autism by providing augmentative alternative communication, language and cognitive treatment services, and social skills treatment in classes. She is also a leader of the Autism Advocacy Partnership at Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center, which focuses on continued staff education and training, advocacy of student needs, and group problem solving. Thank you all for being here and presenting today. I'm gonna to hand this presentation off to Richard, Susie, and Ginger now. Richard, feel free to share your screen and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing great on this sunny, at least where I am in Richmond Friday afternoon. Appreciate everyone taking the time to come and listen to us today, just to make sure you're in the right spot. If you're here with us, you are um, here to hear about Virginia DARS services and special programs to support career pathway achievement. Um, today, you'll uh, be hearing from a, a panel of presenters to include myself. Again, I'm Richard Kreiner. You'll also hear from my colleagues, Susie Klein and Ginger. I'm going to get things started and um, talk a little bit about our VR program and some of the, the exciting specialized services and projects that we have going on more from a macro level. And then I'll hand it off and, and you'll have a chance to hear from Ginger. She's going to share a little bit more information about some of our specialized service array that we have available to clients of our agency at Wilson Workforce Center. And then uh, Susie Klein is going to close us out um, and uh, she's going to talk a little bit from her perspective as a vocational rehab counselor and um, our agency's only autism subject matter expert rehab counselor, kind of some of the, the, the tips and um, strategies to support success when you're working with VR services and, and go a little bit through what that service process might look like. So you get a, a pretty comprehensive look at some of our services and programs. Disclaimer that I will say it's a, it's a lot of information. So we're gonna be cramming a lot into a little box of time and probably any one of these topics we could have spent an hour or so on. Um, but towards the end of the, the, the slides, we'll make sure that there's additional resources provided to the audience for folks that wanna take a deeper dive or have any follow-up questions on information presented today. So with that, I'm gonna get us started. So before I really dive into to some of the content, I, I think that the best place to start, um, a, a place that is very foundational to everything that we're gonna talk about is that just the general concept in terms of how we think about disability, how we think about work and, and what, what all that means. Um, and I'll say right now we're, we're at a really exciting time uh, in our country. We're at a really exciting time in, in terms of the, the way we approach employment and services and, and community living and engagement for people with disabilities that um, you know we've come quite a far We've come quite far. Uh, of course, we still have far to go, but you know, I think as we look at where things are today, the idea of emphasizing um, choice 
informed choice and options and competitive integrated employment are huge. Um, very much part of some of the programs I'm gonna to talk to you about later on, such as the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act. But um, also as, as we think about uh, disability and work and kind of the history of where things are, we, we've really come from you know, back in the, the early days where there was more of an emphasis on looking at folks with disabilities and looking at from a medical model and a deficit checklist, um, perhaps limiting pathways and opportunities for full inclusion and participation in society. And um, obviously um, inclusion and participation in employment and careers. And the, the, the sad thing about all that and, and what's so exciting about where we are today is that when we think about work and we think uh, about how important that is, work and employment truly are transformative. Um, and so it's probably some of the historic, historical misconceptions in terms of more that medical paternalistic type of approach was to keep people safe, to segregate, to, to put them in a day program or put them in a sheltered workshop um, versus when we start to think about um, everybody, um, regardless of ability, disability, is capable and has the right, is entitled to uh, participate in all of the meaningful aspects of community to include employment. And what we find when we look at research is that employment, uh, again, is it's transformative. It, uh, folks that are working are healthier. They have less depression. They have less anxiety. Um, just they're, they're overall medi medically, they're, they're, they're healthier. They have a higher quality of life. They, the fact that they're um, generating earned income um, and achieving levels of self-sufficiency give them more choice and opportunity and option in the community. Um, from a, just from a, a general perspective, right? Kind of socially, how we think about disability um, and um, what communities are like and businesses and organizations are like, the uh, opportunity to achieve a role, a uh, valued role um, in society, such as an employee, it also reflects um, and, and has a positive impact on how communities and systems uh, really embrace and think about and engage folks with disabilities. And so, you know, part of really achieving um, a world where there is that, that diversity and that inclusion and that opportunity um, is, is ensuring that we have a world where folks that we're working with with disabilities have what, that opportunity to achieve uh, career pathways, to be part of um, the competitive integrated um, labor market. Um, and, and, and that's really exciting stuff. So onto the next slide and kind of running with that theme, there's a couple other kind of ideals that I think are really uh, very much intertwined with some of the, the programs and services that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, very much so in terms of the way VA DARS um, in, in, as we provide services, how we think about engaging and working with folks. And, and I would say those two of those major models um, would be the social model of disability, which I, I wanna say probably around the eighties came about. And it's really kind of taken a look at disability and uh, in, in taking it away from saying that disability um, and barriers to achievement and participation barriers to success are inherent in the individual and they're part of the disability. It's kind of shifting that. It's, it's a reactionary kind of idea and it's saying, no, really where the, the barrier and where the disability is, is in the environment. Um, so it's, you know, organizations and policies and access issues and, and attitudes that create the disability. It, it's not about the individual. Uh, and w which is a really good model. And I think there's there's so much of that that still resonates um, to, to today's marketplace and, and to the way we practice and go about doing services. I would say that some proponents of the social model um, might say that if you if you take it and you look at it in a very extreme kind of purist way, that that might um, lead some folks to believe that if you are somebody, an individual that could benefit from services or supports or technology, 
uh, that uh, the, you would you wouldn't do that because you're you're saying uh, it's all about the environment versus looking at it as hey if if there are ways that I can improve my skills or remediate barriers uh, or develop resources that are going to contribute to my success um, then I'm going to do that and and that's really where I kind of like the, the neurodiversity lens. Um, I like it because of that. And I think for today's presentation, it's very appropriate because while we're going to be talking globally about programs that are available through DARS to support individuals with, with all types of disabilities, and we will be talking specifically about some of our autism programs, um, the neurodiversity lens is, is really something that in recent years has become more and more part of the lexicon. And I think it's really exciting. I think it's really exciting as somebody that um, is neurodiverse myself, uh, and as a as a father of a, um, a young boy with autism, I, I like that it. What it does is it really takes and it um, it emphasizes uh, the positive aspects of difference. Um, and th this definition here, which I, I just I think is fantastic, in terms of looking at kind of the social construct of neurodiverse and different kind of cognitive abilities and preferences and styles. Um, it, it compares it to what we might see uh, in terms of biodiversity. So if you think of uh, like an ecosystem or in a habitat and you think of all the different type of fauna and the wildlife there and how critical and essential all of those um, elements within that habitat are, you know, to the point that where you might, if you remove something, that there can be entire collapses, right? So everything's very important to the overall health and the vitality, survival and the growth, the ability to thrive of the ecosystem. Well, that's what neurodiversity is, right? So if we think of neurodiversity, it's essential, it's natural, it's, it's, it adds value to systems, to communities, to organizations. Um, we don't want, if we have everybody that's kind of good at the same thing and thinks in the same way, we're, we're missing opportunities to innovate and to enhance and grow and do better. Um, and that really, to me, if you, if you get to the heart of what thinking about things from the neurodiversity lens, you're, you're opening your perspective up to. Um, so again, as we look at it and we, we kind of take that approach and, and we look to kind of integrate that into our lens for how we work with folks and how we think about employment and how we think about opportunities as we work with folks with autism that are all very unique and individual and come with different skills and interests and abilities and different challenges and resources. You know, what what it really can boil down to is, is you do meet folks where they are and you do work with folks as individuals and we do take a strengths-based approach um, versus that old school kind of deficit checklist type of model. And then when we look at strengths, what we find, and, you know, these are the kind of things, if you think about workplace and you think about creating opportunities within business um, and, and leveraging strengths and abilities to foster achievement, uh, things like, you know, folks that have really strong, unique abilities with their memory, um, ability for, precision and repetition and quality and high, hyper focus tolerance for that repetition or unique visual processing skills you know those are the assets that we we build on that we foster opportunity and we foster achievement with versus looking at challenges um, in that negative kind of deficit light so as I transition, and I, I promise I'm gonna get a little bit more into the VR side of things, I just felt like some of that was really foundational to what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so this next slide, uh, I'm jumping a little bit more now towards the, the employment stuff and, and the, the, the themes towards uh, our services. Um, and I'm leading off though, before I get into that, with a slide that represents um, insight and input and perspective from self-advocates. With, with autism that have been recipients of VR services. And I'll say, I, I, I do reference a brief where I pulled this information from. And um, for those folks who are really researchy, you might look at that and then the insides isn't really huge there. But what I would tell you is these themes that I'm seeing right here. And I think anybody that's kind of looked over some of the evidence-based practice and the, the promising practices, that these are themes that, that run through e throughout all of the, the information that we're seeing. And, and these are things that I think, I hope that you'll find that as we talk about our services and programs are very much 
embedded in what we do. And so from the perspective of the self-advocates with autism that access VR, some of the things that they thought were very important and critical to a quality experience and a positive outcome were things like um, a desire to be treated as an individual. So again, you know, you meet one person with autism, you met one person, and whether we're talking about autism or any disability, right, it's getting to know somebody. They're not a piece of paper, they're not, they're records, they're, um, they're not a disability. Um, so getting to know them for all their unique characteristics, skills, abilities, talents, support needs. Um, on that same thread, and I think this really kind of is very similar, is, is understanding, again, we don't generalize. We don't say, okay, because we're working with somebody with autism. Um, well, folks with autism are all, you know, kind of logic-based thinkers, and they're really good with technology and math and science, and that's not true. So again, if we're really getting to know somebody, meeting, meeting them where they are, and um, learning about who they are, discovering them, then we're not coming with any kind of prefabricated um, ideas or uh, generalizations. Uh, having patience with folks. Um, and I'll kind of, uh, the, the context I would put this one in, in terms of the, the, the information brief, was um, kind of, you know, being patient with somebody as they work through the process and recognizing that um, folks might really have kind of uh, significant uh, discrepancies in areas and abilities. So, uh, and, and I, I sometimes get called on to consult or help out on cases like this. Uh, and it's just, it's a, it's a good example, um, not to generalize, but VR client might come in, um, very talented academically, maybe have a PhD. Um, so they're, they've achieved, they've done very well uh, in post-secondary education. And we're working with them to move transition into employment and develop a plan for employment and, and success in employment. And it's the ability to look at, at somebody and again, recognize, don't assume just because they've achieved all that and they're capable of all that, that there might not be other challenges or support needs related to, to the, the underlying characteristics of their uh, neurological cognitive differences. For example, um, somebody who has a PhD and did really great in school may also need some coaching and some support with applying for and participating in job interviews. Or they might need some support and putting things in place like um, calendars and or self-organization and reminder systems. Um, and, you know, those kind of things can all be very much a part of kind of some of the executive functioning or adaptive skills differences. And it doesn't take away anything from the person, um, but most importantly is, again, is not making assumptions and getting to know somebody and really slowing down and, and working with them at a pace that makes sense and giving them the supports where those supports are needed. Um, the other two things here, um, continue uh, supports post-placement. And that's just the idea that, you know, a lot of times beyond, and that's saying beyond 90 days, right? And so a lot of times with VR, there's a placement and it is a time limited services. So ultimately um, a case is closed, um, ideally um, successful, employed. Um, but recognizing that uh, it's something like autism is lifelong and it's pervasive. And um, sometimes, you know, circumstances are one way and say an employment situation and things might change. They might change at work, a new supervisor or a new program or a new, new um, task demand. Things might change in somebody's home life and, and kind of that recognition of having a way to access a, uh, a support, a mentor, a coach, to navigate those kind of things, to um, check in with. And, and the cool thing about VR programs, and you'll hear a little bit about this later on, is things like our supported employment program, our customized employment program um, include, after a case is closed, um, long-term follow along services. So it's like a, a lower intensity, but there is an ongoing contact. Um, so in Virginia, we have that, that kind of mechanism in place. And then um, the last piece here, employment can happen without VR assistance. And that's a little misleading just in terms of the, the statement as it was framed in the brief without reading through the content. And what this was really talking about, the, the, what folks were getting at was um, there was a concern that sometimes in working with VR services, 
that um, there was more of an emphasis just to place somebody in a job versus helping them develop a career pathway and um, putting them along a, within a job that's a good fit for their interests, skills, abilities, and talents. All right, so next slide. Some of the things that came up with VR counselors, I'm not gonna spend a long time on this. Um, they, they're on this, this, the same focus groups that they did um, where they gathered information from the um, autistic self-advocates. They spoke to VR counselors that, um, and then they had some basic requirements in terms of folks that were supporting and serving folks with autism and had some years of experience. And the things that VR counselors said that were really important to fostering successful outcomes and employment when working with individuals with autism included having access to things like customized strategies and supports. So again, that kind of goes back to that whole thread we were talking about earlier with things needing to be individualized, not being stuck in this kind of, we have very rigid, fixed uh, types of services. Um, the, the value there in, in not doing that is being able to kind of treat each case like an individual having an array or a menu of services and support that you can pull in um, that to fit that individual, their, their context, that case. And then even within those services and supports, having some flexibility in how we implement and carry things out, you know, with the ultimate um, and always the intent of being um, fostering a successful and positive employment outcome for the individual that we're working with. Building rapport, was critical. Um, again, you know, you get meet folks where they are, spend time getting to know them. Um, and sometimes, you know, what's really important to remember there is sometimes in services and programs, you know, we can get a little bit stuck in that um, routine of this is our process, this is our protocol, and it, and it can seem rigid and impersonal. And what we've always found in, in our autism services program, and I would say this generalizes across all populations that we work with, but spending that extra time really getting to know somebody um, and facilitating engagement opportunities where they feel prepared and they're comfortable and they feel safe um, is, is extremely valuable because developing that rapport is, is really gonna be something that can be leveraged in developing an effective plan of services and supports and um, facilitating that success. And then the last piece is understanding the individual's um, strengths and weaknesses. And again, I'd say in Virginia, we've got some really cool things that we've developed as it relates to autism and that specific um, point right there uh, related to some unique assessment strategies. Uh, we call them autism centered, kind of community based, uh, collaborative. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as we move down in the slides. Um, Really quick, uh, just to talk about the state federal VR program. So again, um, the presentation uh, you're, you're receiving today is all centered around DARS and which is uh, Virginia DARS, the, the state uh, federal vocational rehab program. Um, and, and just some of the key federal legislation and some of the movements that are going on that are really kind of shaping uh, VR uh, today, uh, you know, I'd say we have to start with the smith Fess Act of 1920 that got it all started. Hooray, we're 100 years old this year. Um, with the, the smith Fess Act, when that started, it was really specific to um, individuals who had served in the military, um, who were injured and needed services and supports to return to um, back to the community and, and employment. And it was really focused on physical disabilities. Um, so between 1920 and today, there's been a whole lot of change and movement and progress um, within the VR program, but I'm gonna fast forward us all the way up to today, because I just, I don't have time to walk all through that. Again, I'll make sure we got a link for anybody that wants to go see some of the, the really cool history and timelines. There's, there's been a good bit of that um, recently developed to celebrate 100 years of VR. Um, so that's information I can link folks to if they want it. But um, employment first. So I'd, I'd say employment first, right around the, the 80s, John Butterworth was really kind of a champion for the idea of employment first. Um, the, the concept being, you know, it kind of links back to that first slide I hit on is that individuals with disabilities are entitled, capable, and if we're really talking about the ideal outcome, need to be given a pathway and opportunity 
to facilitate informed choices about competitive integrated employment. Um, that that's what quality, that's what the good life is, and that's what um, we we really want to shoot for. Uh, so we're not looking at um, sub minimum wage. We're not looking at things like day programs. Um, you know, we're, we're we're looking at giving folks a, a chance to have a really meaningful, uh, rich, interconnected, and um, valued. Uh, position within their, their communities um, through employment. The Workforce Opportunities and Innovation Act really made some significant changes to the, the its predecessor, the Rehab Act. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those things because, um, they're again, they're really exciting things. And, and like I said at the beginning of this presentation, I think we're at a really exciting time that there's been tremendous progress and the future looks really bright. You know, there's there's Continue, we need to continue to push and innovate and grow, but the, the things that are in place today uh, really have, have um, created an environment where the ability to foster and facilitate career pathway and opportunities and quality of life are, are very viable um, where they may not have been a decade ago. Uh, so with uh, WIOA, we're looking at things like increased transition services. WIOA specifically talks a lot about um, services for in-school youth with disabilities. I want to say um, starting age 14, um, yes, age 14, you know, so like really engaging folks. The idea being like, hey, we don't wait till they're out of school. Um, and, and I'm guessing, you know, for other folks that might reflect on their journey and their pathway to you know where they ended up in their careers you know i started working at 13 and and i had probably 30 different jobs before you know i graduated with my bachelor's degree and then you know 10 more before my master's and so like that employment's really important because we develop social capital we we discover you know what we're interested in um it, it's it's a way of being uh, socially engaged and involved in things that are meaningful and exciting and um, important to you. Uh, expand and improve upon employment services. I, I mentioned earlier um, customized employment. Uh, so customized employment was something that was added to WIOA. And then there's other things that are uh, part of uh, WIOA that really allow for more of a service array and a process of engaging and working with folks that values career pathways. Um, opportunities for folks to be engaged, competitive, integrative employment, to have careers where they can grow, uh, they can get increased wages and have increased opportunities for promotion and advancement versus just a placement or a job. And then the emphasis on competitive, integrated employment. I'm looking at my clock. So I, um, I'm going um, a little bit over and I wanna make sure I have time for the rest of our um, speakers. Really quickly, I just want to say, and, and um, you all hear about this a little bit later, um, numbers of uh, folks that we've, we've been seeing an increase in the number of folks with autism accessing VR services. Uh, results have been really positive as we look at the impact of our autism focused programs. Um, we've also see that there, because we're doing more of an intensive wraparound approach that sometimes it, the cost is uh, slightly higher, I think around $1,000 higher for an autism case versus all other categories. And then things like AT and the wraparound supports are really important um, supporting for supporting the process and success. Um, I'm gonna skip through, you guys will get the slides, uh, the, the explanation of some of the different services we had. Um, other than just to hit them really quick. So some of the, the, the special programs and services that we have, and I wasn't gonna go into detail anyways, would just um, be things like our Prietz program, which is a unique service that was developed um, as part of WIOA. Um, it, it is actually for, for in-school youth with disabilities and can be provided to individuals that are not actually um, participants in the VR program. Uh, it, and it's kind of a layered approach, starts more general and then can move to more specific and then ultimately to a referral to VR if that's what the individual um, chooses to do. Customized employment is a new model. Uh, customized employment, similar to supported employment, but customized employment is really about working with an individual, uh, identifying their abilities, skills and talents, um, and then going out and developing a brand new position opportunity 
for them um, that also fits a business need. So it's not job carbon, it's not a, like demand side placement. It's it's completely new approach. Project search is another program. Uh, that's a project, I think we have make, maybe 19 different sites around the state. Um, again, you'll have the slides and there's some links to more information on that, but it's a transition-based program for uh, individuals in their last year of school. It's conducted in a house business site and it's a collaborative partnership with VR, um, Department of Education and a, uh, a house business and providers that are providing supports there. WISA and wraparound services, this really gets to some of the things that we look at around supporting people with uh, financial uh, sufficiency, financial empowerment, understanding um, what's going to happen to their benefits, uh, their cash benefits and, and their medical insurance and things like that when they go to work and tapping into things like ABLE accounts and work incentive counseling and um, work incentives to facilitate that transition. Um, Susie will talk more about the autism model just to say it's kind of in integrated in our VR program um, and a lot of the practices I've already mentioned here for you guys. Some of the wraparound supports include our community support services um, programs, our peers for young adults, mm. therapeutic behavior services, and assistive technology. Um, and those are just all things that we integrate and wrap in. Then lastly, I would say DARS also has kind of a, a unique unit that provides business services. So it's separate um, from our client services side, but this is where we go out and we work with workforce. We educate, do disability awareness, help link them with talent and resources um, that um, are individuals that we're serving and, and developing for the workforce. Okay, with that, I'm gonna pass that on. Ginger, I'm sorry, I went over my time. Oh, that's um, okay, I can go fast. Yours. Just stay with me to help me click. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Ginger Shiflett. I'm a speech language pathologist at Wilson Workforce and Rehab Center. And we are in a little rural area called Fishersville. Um, so, WWRC is actually a part of DARS. We used to kind of be the first cousin, but now we are actually a part of DARS, which kind of means that um, for somebody to be referred to us, they have to have DARS services. So that changed about two years ago. Uh, but I just want to tell you some of the things that we have to offer here for our students with autism. So um, we do offer vocational evaluation, and that is for the PERT students, which are typically underage, still, you know, within the school system, and adults as well. Um, the next thing we offer is called PrEP, and that's kind of like um, teaching soft skills in a way, um, pre-employment readiness education program. So that program focuses on things that people need to have in order to get ready to go to work. Attendance, punctuality, hygiene, attitude, work stamina. Um, that is a nine week program that we offer people who are almost ready to start training programs, but they need to start working on some of their soft skills. Okay, next. Um, these are our current vocational training programs that we offer. And this changed about a year ago. So this is a bit condensed. Um, we have eight programs that you see in front of us. And a lot of times if we don't have a particular program up there, like say somebody's interested in animal care, well, we don't have animal care training right on, on site, right at WWRC. So we send them out into the community, but still with the WWRC supervision. Um, so those are the current eight training programs that we offer, okay? Um, so here are some of the behavioral support services groups and classes that tend to be the most popular with our students with autism spectrum disorder. We have classes known as socialization through recreation controlling anger and behavior. We have a stress management group. We have a movement group. And then we have a life after WWRC group, which is like sort of transitioning. Now, you know, you've gotten your treatment services, you've gotten your vocational training services, 
you're getting ready to go out into the world. So what are the next steps? That's what that group focuses on. Okay, next. Um, we have a communication skills group. This is done in my department. Um, and then we have a social literacy group and an autism support group where folks meet once a week just to talk about stressors, what's going well, what's not going well. Um, our autism support group right now is giving us a lot of feedback regarding how they felt with our COVID reopening procedures. Um, you know, with sensory issues, sometimes these masks can be a hindrance. Um, and so our autism support group talks about things like that. Okay, next. Um, the communication skills group, again, that's a group run in my department. We have, it's basically a social skills group. Um, we have open enrollment. There's about 10 curriculum topics and we focus on pragmatics or social skills. So we have sessions that involve um, direct social skills intervention, but then we try to have fun too. So we do role play, videotaping, interactive games. We look at YouTubes, uh, you know, a lot of various things to keep their attention, keep them motivated. Okay, next. Um, the communication skills group was very popular. Um, and it was determined that a lot of these social skills were needed all across campus. So the communication skills group curriculum has turned more into like social skills classes. And that's now a part of the prep curriculum. That's that nine week program I was telling you about that happens prior to somebody starting a training program. And now it's also um, available for all students in um, the business and computer training programs. So it's, it's really taken off. It's become very popular and all the different training programs actually would like for it to be a piece of their curriculum, but there's only, we only have three speech therapists here currently. Okay, next. Um, our autism support group that I mentioned, um, it's open process oriented support group. It provides kind of a safe place for students to discuss problems, issues, and unusual interests. Like you might get a whole group of people that everybody loves anime and that's what they wanna talk about. Or everybody in there loves video games and that's their special interest and that's what they wanna talk about. Um, so um, it introduces students with ASD to each other and it has helped to decrease some isolation or the tendency for students to wanna kind of just navigate to their rooms and not come out and socialize. Um, and it helps introduce new students to more senior students for informal mentoring. Okay, next. Um, the Autism Advocacy Partnership has kind of started and stopped for a couple of years, but the past three years now we've been going strong. Um, so that is something here on campus where we have representatives from each of our departments um, that are invited to a monthly meeting. Um, new information is presented each month for team building and collaboration. And one of the neatest things we do are confidential case concerns. So maybe we have an instructor that has a student with ASD who's distributing or, uh, you know, demonstrating behaviors that maybe that instructor is not sure how to manage. And without naming names, we discuss, you know, strategies that might help. And then we also um, establish yearly autism trainings on new and upcoming research types of things so that all of our staff can stay more up to date. Okay, next. So these are just additional service availabilities that we have here on campus. We have AT, obviously speech, that's me, OT. OT does a lot of sensory evaluations and treatment. Um, our audiologist is now doing a lot of auditory processing evaluations for our ASD. Um, population. We have psychology and psychiatry, physical therapy. Um, so we're sort of a hybrid facility where we've got 
therapy services, support services, and then we've got vocational training. So we're actually known as being a hybrid, okay? Um, just additional kind of neat things that we have um, that would be considered additional supports for folks with ASD is we've started QR codes for visual learners. Um, so we've got QR codes in the dorms and the laundry areas and in some classrooms that will do YouTube demonstrations of how to do basic skills, cleaning, laundry, that type of thing. And eventually we plan to have those for route finding because we're kind of a big, a big campus. Um, so we hope to have those in place to help students with route finding issues eventually as well. Okay, next. Then we've got sensory carts and sensory rooms um, for our students with autism, next. Um, and then we have a peer mentoring program that was active prior to COVID and that we plan on hopefully getting in place when COVID dies down a little. Um, but that, uh, you know, it's just like what it sounds like. It, that would be where for example, a student with autism that maybe was having trouble with social interaction in the evenings, that type of thing, um, voluntarily, you know, the, the mentor would be a volunteer and they would be paired with a mentor to maybe get them to do more things in the evenings or that type of thing, get them more socially involved. Okay, next. And then our residential services, because most people, unless you happen to be local, do come and, you know, they live here during their stay. Our dorm assignments are carefully considered based on the needs of the individual. So like if they're sensory needs, they wouldn't, for example, pair up somebody with sensory issues with like a smoker, that type of thing. Um, we have the opportunity for early lunch line or quiet areas to eat based on the needs of the individual. And then we have staff readily available to mentor, mediate, and assist with problem solving as needed. Okay. Um, so the last slide talks about our COVID changes. Um, and this is based on some of our new virtual services. So PERT is our program for the underage. Well, they're not necessarily underage. They most of the time are, but they're typically still involved with the school systems. Um, and so now there's an option. The students can come for vocational evaluation through PERT and independent living skills training five days on campus, or if they would rather, they can come five days for the same types of services, but virtual. Um, speech and OT and even some PT is now offering some types of virtual therapy. I'm doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one virtual social skills therapy. Um, even our learner's permit services can now be virtual. Some portions of VocaVal can be. Um, and then we are doing virtual orientation and online tours. So that's because of COVID. Okay. So I am now gonna turn it over to Susie Klein, who is our autism subject matter specialist, rehab counselor. Take it Hi. away, Miss Susie. Hi, Ginger. Thank you Hi. for great information. Um, I also wanted to add both Richard and I participate in the um, autism advocacy partnership um, meetings and we really enjoy that. And then um, our office also hosts a um, a meeting to share resources and uh, Ginger and other participants from Wilson when they can attend those too. So we can keep up on the practices and um, talk about referrals and what would work best for someone. So um, it's a wonderful group, both of them. I wanna make sure that we get this information first. Oh, I'm Susie Klein. I moved here from Alaska. I have a 32 year old son I, with autism. I've been doing this a long time and I've been with the Charlottesville DARS office since 2013 as an intern and 2014 as a counselor. Um, so here's some information about how to learn more about DARS. This is the website. 
um, what we do, we talked a lot about, we assist people with disabilities to prepare for, enter and engage in gainful employment. It's voluntary. Um, and our goal with everyone is, you know, competitive, integrative employment. And I like to add, you know, we look for, especially with autism, you know, the right environment with the right employer, with the right supports for the right wage. So, <laughs> so that's how I approach that. Um, I work out of the Charlottesville office and we serve, um, let's see, Louisa, Green, Fluvanna, Buckingham, Albemarle, Nelson County, and the city of Charlottesville. So if, if you're wanting to um, participate in DAR services, then you would contact that office. If not, you go to this website and you look at the other offices and get their contact information and you can start the process. We also have referral sources from the CSBs and we participate in all of the schools, so we also get referral sources from them. Next slide, please. So if you wanna get started in with VR, so, so here's a, a flow chart, very basic, but I think helpful. So if someone comes to you and they express interest in employment, or you are talking about that either with your friends or with your families, um, you know, maybe inquire a little bit, why does the person want to work? You know, get a little information. You can contact DARS and we will further that conversation through an intake appointment. You could also go to support learning about exposure to employment. You might have an idea that maybe, maybe other things could work. So that's like um, volunteering. That's like uh, church activities. If you have those uh, other social activities, learning some of those skills that Ginger talked about that are important in terms of, exposure to trying different things. And, and one of the ones I tell parents a lot is, you know, activities and chores, you know, have people start helping um, anyways. And then you contact ours, you can still contact ours. So notice that most of these paths lead to contact ours. So then also explore together the obstacles to overcome and achieve with employment and then still contact ours. We will also discuss those things because we know that it's a process. There's a big picture of things that are needed and it takes some time. Next slide, please. So if you're not sure about employment, which that happens as well, um, and you present the idea of employment to someone and then you maybe inquire more about why don't they want to work and some of that might be misconceptions and some of that might be fear. But I've also realized, especially working with autism is there's sometimes not the conceptual ability to understand what that means like. I, you know, I have to leave home, I have to get up at a different time. So sometimes talking about sort of that wider picture and then answering some of the anxieties about, well, would I be able to still have lunch here? Would I be able to do this or that? We will talk about all of that. Um, support their learning about an exposure to employment, you know, give them some ideas or let them work with you. If you have an activity that you do that they're interested in, have them work along with you. And then again, um, explore solutions to those feared obstacles or obstacles, sorry, and then again, still contact ours. We can have those conversations with you um, to assess whether is this the right time, is this something we want to try now. As long as you know we keep funded, we're still here. So, and Richard said we are, you know, federally funded as well. So, next. Oh, thank you for that. Common misconceptions. Um, frequently people are fearful that they're going to lose their benefits. And so Richard talked about, we have the wraparound supports through a WISA, which is someone who can do a benefits analysis if you're receiving um, social security benefits. Um, they also talk about the different incentives and programs, um, fearful about the IQ, can't work fast enough, the hours, not having transportation, um, so all of these things will be addressed as part of an intake because yes, you will have to at some point have a transportation plan and that is something that DARS can discuss with you. Um, and then sometimes we can also support people to help get their learner's permits and their driver's license. And one of those options um, Ginger talked about was some of that is done through Wilson. Next. So, if you decide to, you're at the point where you want to um, 
make contact. So you call your local Virginia DARS office. We are actually the Division of Rehab Services. So we are the DRS. So both are okay, DARS or DRS. And you set up your intake appointment. When you call, you may be asked some of this information. Um, it's personal information, but part of that is necessary as we proceed. We are about work. So social security number at some point needs to be recorded. Um, but we'll want your name and address, your phone number, um, when you're okay with sharing the disability. The address is important because that determines um, what counselor is assigned to your case. So part of that is based on what county you're in and where you live. So if you're not in the Charlottesville office, as I discussed, find your local DARS office and make that contact. Next. Okay, so working with your VR counselor, some things that you can ex in expect would be a lot of customer engagement. And we already covered the person-centered approach, uh, meeting people where they're at, ensuring communication access. So ask, we'll ask you what's the best way you receive communication. Since we've been teleworking, one of the things that I did was um, I, I acquired a mobile work phone and I get so much more communication now that um, the people I work with can text me. So that's pretty wonderful. So we find out which way that, which communication works best and then we try and accommodate that. Um, also the recognized behavior as a form of a communication. All counselors in the office are looking at when people are doing behaviors, they're trying to tell us something. And so we will work with that. We'll find out um, as best we can what that's about. And then um, the support need for real life experiences. And again, we talked about, this is all going to be about services that move towards competitive integrated employment. And I wanna stress that they're individualized. Richard had indicated there are a whole array of different services that we have culminated and understand that we have access to and can be used. And those will be based on each person's individual needs. And then we have effective teaming. And, and I must say that's one of my favorite ways of working together because a lot of people come with, you know, uh, parents, family members, other supports that are part of this. You might have waiver, you might have a CSB person, you might have a counselor. Um, I'm sure I've missed someone. But having those meetings together is very, very helpful. Understanding the roles and responsibilities and the good communication, everyone's expectations, and then hearing how ideas about how we're going to um, walk through this process. Okay. And there will be documentation, <laughs> papers to sign back and forth. Uh, let's see what time. I'm talking quickly. So these are just helpful tips. This will be in the slide, but I think the biggest one is consider having someone come to your intake appointment. And we're doing that virtually. I use Google Hangout a lot and it's wonderful because I see more parents now or um, support people in my office when I'm doing an intake. So I really appreciate that. Things you share are confidential. Um, there are a couple exceptions to that, which we talk about in the intake. Um, and if you're having any kind of issues in the meeting, we'll take breaks, we'll talk about stuff, use your strategies. Um, we try and keep, I virtually, I try and keep those meetings to about 30 minutes because it's a lot of focus and concentration. And I really like this last thing about, you know, the informed choice we covered, but you're the driver of the process and we help with the map. And sometimes our direction will change. So we'll just keep adjusting the map. And I borrowed this and some of the next slides from the California Department of um, Rehabilitation because I really liked how they outlined it. So next. So when you come to a meeting, please think about what your strengths are because we're gonna ask about that. And then we're gonna ask about the things you need help with. And these checklists are so that you can get start thinking, um, what do I need help with? And so you just check those things and you can bring those to the meeting. Next, more examples. And more examples about the social skills. So I'll go as fast as I can because I think we're pretty close to done. But I just want to share some examples of individualized activities that we've done since we've had these teams together and we've been working together with these um, collaborative teams with the Autism Project. One of the great things that we 
we um, started doing was working with uh, occupational therapists and um, one particular company used interactive metronome technique and several of our participants have benefited from that. Um, it's a series of sessions where they've been able to increase tolerance and competing attention, which is very important for driving and for work activities. It's also been beneficial with uh, decreasing anxiety and stress, and it has assisted with the success for some of our young men to obtain their driver's licenses, which has been really wonderful. We also on here, we talked about this peer social skills, customized employment, vocational evaluations, um, so behavior support plans, I know that could be a worry. So an issue comes, um, we've had this happen. Uh, lots of times in the interpersonal area, people come to work, they get the job and all of a sudden they're talking about things that are not particularly okay in the job market, in the job site. So we would come in and assess that and maybe even um, add a behavior support plan for that. And then um, I wanna add that we spend a lot of time with discovery. I call it front loading, but the more we get to know the person we're working with, I think the better we're gonna be able to help facilitate this process. So it is individualized and we wanna do a lot of discovery to learn a lot about the person. So um, it is going to be a process. And then the last thing that's not on here is, um, for some people, we help them develop not just strategies, but a sensory support kit, something that's, um, useful to them. I even have some in my office. People come in, there's a two or three you can choose from and people sit down and they choose what they want and it helps us get through the conversations. Um, sometimes they use the fidget, it just depends. But those things are helpful. Next. We already talked about, we have a village. So people, everyone who's involved can be a part of this. Next. All right, so Richard, this is back to you. These are our closing points. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Susie, and thank you, Ginger. Um, fantastic information. Yeah, and, and closing, and I, again, I wanna apologize that we, we have so much information um, and um, I know we were just really kind of able to touch the surface on things. Perhaps this presentation is gonna leave you with more questions and answers and I uh, wanna say, please reach out if you do have questions and remember that we do have some links and some resources here for you as well. Um, but you know, the key, I think um, really important kind of themes that ran throughout the discussion today Attitude matters, you know, both uh, in terms of the attitudes that we bring with us, the, the attitudes that we set for ourselves, the beliefs and the values, but then really how we approach, you know, the, the, the greater um, goal of transitioning into employment and the value and contribution that individuals can make to the business community um, and to their, their neighborhoods and, and, and to, to their local communities. Collaboration is key. Um, so the, the, the really it starts, you know, at home and the, the types of things that individuals can start doing on their own. They can do with loved ones and caregivers that can support them with exposure to work and developing some um, understanding of their interests and their strengths and their support needs. It uh, continues on to secondary school um, and having opportunities really, you know, in an ideal situation for some community-based um, competitive integrated employment opportunities prior to leaving high school. And, and perhaps, you know, that's something that um, can be accomplished by connecting with our pre program. And then, you know, the other thing is always, you know, pay attention to and make sure that we're embracing and uh, facilitating access to best practice, you know, and that um, would really kind of, you know, be a nod to some of the approaches that we're using, whether it's the way we really um, do a comprehensive community-based assessment um, that includes discovery and it includes, uh, you know, interviews with folks uh, that know the individual well and exposure to different um, discovery types of activities in the community and in, in the neighborhoods to observe and learn about somebody's strengths and their support needs, um, all the way to, you know, the kind of the service array we offer, you know, through programs like 
Wilson discuss their communication skills group and their behavior support services and their peer mentoring supports, as well as the, the different strategies that Susie talked about with AT and sensory supports. So, um, you know, those are really just kind of some of the characteristics and qualities we embrace as a program. Um, and I think uh, the characteristics and qualities that as we work with our broader partners and our, with our stakeholders, we, we hope to be able to continue to embrace and um, really prioritize. So uh, again, mentioned there were some resources. Uh, thank you everybody for your time today. I uh, hope this was information was helpful. Mm -hmm.